I've entitled this message, The, the Tracks of My Tears. Because really and truly, this song could be for every one of us, depending on the seasons we're in, right? Uh, the, probably every one of us have gone through a, a, a time in our life. And listen, if you haven't gone through a time in your life, then, 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 then you will. I mean, you're either going into a difficult time, you're in a difficult time, or you're coming out of a difficult time. That's life. And so I, I wanted to, so, so there's a lot of us that can say, you know what, I, I've either been in a, series, a season, I'm in a season, uh, I'm coming out of a season, until where, where really and truly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I may have told a joke or two, I, I may have been happy and I may have laughed, but my heart betrayed my face. And down deep, if you, if you took a closer look at me, you would realize that, that, that I'm hurting. You'd realize that, that I'm, I'm carrying something. See, all of us may know what it's like to hit rock bottom in life or when, when the bottom just falls out of your life. And, and I just have to tell you, nothing can prepare you. For, there is no class for that. There is really no book for that. Uh, there's a relationship with the Lord. We're going to talk about that. But there's, there's, there's really no class of how to handle it when they say your, your, your daughter has, has a brain tumor. It's like in life, it's like rock bottom. And, and you know, really and truly, when, when you look at life, most of our life is like mid-altitude. Most of our life is like cruising altitude. If, if you've flown in a plane, you know that, right? You know that the majority of the trip is like at this safe cruising altitude. Occasionally in life, we hit a summit or a, a peak, a wedding, a promotion, the birth of a child, a vacation, a celebration with, with friends. But, but really and truly, most of life is spent at mid-level. Most of life is spent at a cruising altitude to where it's just the, the routines of life, carpools and expense reports and jobs and... and uh, and taking care of kids and taking care of, t- care of parents and grocery shopping and, and chores and all of that other stuff. But, but occasionally, occasionally the bottom drops out. The economy crashes or there, there's, there's reductions at the office or the job site or the, the test results from the talk doctor comes back bad or someone no longer wants to live with you or your parents are divorcing or, or someone is terminal, someone is passing away and, and before we know it, we, we, we realize we're, the bottom has dropped out and we're in the rock bottom of life. And, and, and how do you deal with that? Now, real quickly, I'm, I'm going to give you five stages of grief. Now, a counselor would give this to you. If you went to a counselor, I'm going to give it to you for free. How's that? You can't beat that. And so I'm going to give you the five stages of, of grief. And I'm just going to go through these quickly so that you can recognize them. I could, go ver- I could go through the book of Job, and Job went through every one of these. And so these, these, are, these are biblical, and, and, and God has, has uh, given us these stages of grief for a reason. So the first stage is this. The first stage is just denial. I mean, the first the denial helps us survive the loss. It's that stage to where all of a sudden what we have heard is just like overwhelming to us. And a lot of times we'll make comments like, I can't believe this is happening to me. I cannot believe I'm going through this. I cannot believe this is my, my path in life. And, and sometimes in the denial stage, people can act like there's really and truly maybe not anything wrong. And, but denial helps us pace our, our feelings of, of grief. In other words, it, it, it's God's way, I believe, it's God's way of allowing us to handle as much as we can at the time. So walk through denial. The second stage is this is anger. Anger is a necessary stage of, of the healing process. A lot of us are, are afraid of anger because many times we've seen anger wrongfully handled in a destructive way, but anger can be handled in a, in a proper way. And, and um, you know, the, the thing about anger, anger really has no limits. Uh, Anger can extend to your, when you, go, when, when you hit rock bottom, anger can extend to your friends. You can get angry at your friends. They didn't support me the way that I thought they should. They didn't use the right scripture. They didn't encourage me properly. They said something. They didn't say anything. So anger can go to your friends. It can go to your family. Anger can be directed at a doctor about why couldn't you do something? Why, you know, why couldn't you take care of this? It, it, anger can be directed at yourself. See, anger is a secondary emotion, and underneath anger is this issue of pain. And a lot of times the issue is, is where is God in all of this, and, and, and how, can, how can this be my path in life? And I, I thought God called me to this, and, and I, think God, I thought God wanted me to do this. And it, it's a natural, listen, it's a natural feeling to, to, to feel that you've been abandoned uh, um, 
And, and anger is a way that we express that. The, the, the next one is this, is just bargaining. That's when you begin to bargain with God, and that's where you say, you know what, God, if you, if you take care of this, I'll give 100% to the church. Maybe 50, maybe 25, right? If you take care of this, I'm back in church. I'm, I'm like, I, I will even serve. I mean, if you just, t- I mean, that's right. That's, that's, where, that's where we bargain. I mean, I, I got caught up in that. I mean, I got caught up in saying, you know what, God, if you take care of this, uh, what, a one, what an unbelievable testimony. We will leverage this testimony of you healing my do- do- uh, daughter uh, for you. And God, like, pushed back and says, well, what if I don't? Am I still good? He's still good. And I'm telling you, God is still good. And he's sovereign. And he's in control. The, la- the, the next one is this, is just depression. Depression is not a sign of mental illness. It's, it's an appropriate response to a great loss. It's to where you can withdraw for, from life and withdraw from a period of time and it kind of leads, leads, you, leads you or leaves you in a, in a fog of an intense sadness and wondering perhaps if there's any point of, of going on and why go on at all. And then the last one is this, is just acceptance. Now listen, don't, don't misunderstand acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean that, that you think everything's okay or everything's all right with, or you're okay with what has happened. That's not the case. Most people don't ever feel okay or all right. Sometimes when they go through a rock bottom experience in their life, it's coming to the place to where you're saying, you know what, this is just my new normal. This is just my new normal in life, and this is our, this is our permanent reality in life, and, and uh, this is where you just kind of learn to, to, to live with it. It's finding ac- acceptance into where it's having more good days than than bad days. It's where you begin to like live again and live life again and invest in people and relationships. It's, it's, it, listen, let me tell you something. My life and your life experiences do not determine the faithfulness of God. And, and the word, not our life experiences, determine him. And so I, I, I just want to walk you through Psalm, Psalm 142. I want to walk you through what it means to biblically lament. How do, how do you process out, your, process out your feelings and process out your emotions when, when the bottom lets out of your life or when you hit rock bottom? There's, a, there's 150 psalms. Uh, 67 of them are psalms of lament. And in other words, they're, they're, they're promises of God in, in, in real life. And so when, when, when you read the psalms of, of, of lament, uh, it's easy to begin to trace their tears. In fact, is Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134 is written uh, by, by a group of people that are in, 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 in the pit of life. They're the Psalms of Ascent. In other words, it means that, 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 that they're in a pit. They're, they're talking about this rock bottom experience, but they're not, they're not going to be in the pit forever. In other words, they sing songs and they would sing these Psalms of Ascent when they went down to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and it was a picture of life that they're not going to be in that season forever. Psalm 137, 4, the psalmist asked a question. In fact, is some people asked the question of the psalmist and said, how can you worship in your pain? How can you sing in your pain? How can you continue to have joy in your pain? And many of you have asked Karen and I that question. Many of you have asked Karen, how do you continue to go on? And how do you continue to serve? And how do you continue to have joy? And how do you continue to worship him in the midst of your pain? And it's because of this issue of learning how to trace the tracks of your, of, of your tears. Listen, let me tell you something. Pain does not have the last word for us. In heaven, you will not praise God for your pain. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, he wrote these words and he said, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Our understanding of God cannot begin with our experiences. It starts with His, it starts with his word. I mean, I've told you life is like this. Life is like railroad tracks. 
Life is like standing in the center of railroad tracks. And this rail over here is some, some good stuff. And this rail over here, here is some really, really bad stuff. And it's learning that to navigate through life. The good, the hurtful, the painful stuff, as well as the good stuff in life. So I want to I help you to understand tonight. And I want to give you hope. That if you've, if you've been in that season... If you're in that season, if you're coming out of that season, how do you trace the tracks of your tears in a, in a, in a healthy way? Because how do you worship him in your pain? See, when you, when you lament, when you lament, you're not placing blame. You don't, you don't really even care whose fault it is. You just know you hurt. And you just know it's painful. Now, Jesus prayed a l lament, right? On the cross, Jesus prayed, My God, my God, why have, have you for, forsaken me? So there's five parts of a biblical lament. And, and, and in my opinion, this is just something in the contemporary church that is not talked about a lot any longer. And I think it's something that we, we need to have more conversations about. And so, so here's the first principle that we're just going to walk through Psalm 142. So here's the first principle. If you're going to trace the tracks of your tears, if you're going to biblically lament, the first thing is this, is you address God directly. You address, you, you address him directly. Psalm 142, verses 1, he says, with, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my, here we go, I pour out my complaint before him, and I tell my trouble before him. Some of you may have come out of, of, of spiritual backgrounds to where you were taught that you, n you never complain about God. You never bring a complaint to him. Listen, when you lament, this comes from a place of trust. This comes from a place of faith. In other words, you know what you're saying, God? If you don't, I'm hurting, and if you don't make sense of my pain, if you don't help me figure this out, I cannot make it. God, I, I have questions. I thought I, ca I was called to this. I thought you asked me to do this. I, I didn't think this is my path. I didn't think this is what I was going to have to go through. See, the, the Bible says this. The Bible says that God desires to, to use everything in your life. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world to where a lot of bad stuff happens. And God desires, listen, to use everything in your life. Listen, when David's life bottomed out, when David hit rock bottom, here's what he prayed. Here's what he said, Psalm 139, 7. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? So he's asking questions. Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed and chill, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other most parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. In other words, he, he's crying out to God, and listen, your story may different, be different, and your story may read, where, where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the rehab hab clinic, if I go to the ICU, if I go to divorce court, if I go to the shelter for battered women, if I go to the county jail, if I go to the doctor's office, if I go to the hospital waiting room, if I go to an operating room, if I go to a funeral home, if I go to an un un unemployment line, God, you are there. I cannot get away from your presence. Listen, let me tell you something. When you're a believer, you can never say, I went through hell. Because hell is the absence of God. You and I as believers, we've never gone through hell. Listen, listen you will never go where God is not. You will never go where he is not. Acts 17, 27 says, But they shall seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually, watch this, not far from, from each of us. Listen, you, you will never go where God is not. It does not matter where you go. In traffic, he is there. In the grocery store, he is there. In the hospital, the funeral home, he is there. Job site, workplace, he is there. Listen, God does not play fa favorites. All people can enjoy the presence of God, but many don't. And they live their life and they walk through life as if God is not there and God does not love them. As if their strength is their, their own and as if the, the, their solution only comes from themselves, only comes from within and not from above. 
In other words, they, they live godless lives. And even professed believers sometimes live as if God does not exist. And the strength and their answers only come from within and not from above. Listen, you have to make God's presence your passion. And, and how do you do that? You, you become more, listen, you become more like a sponge than a rock. You know, I, 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 can, take a, I can take a rock and I can immerse a rock in, in a river. And the exterior, the externals of that rock will get wet. Um, it, it may change colors. It, it may darken. But that, that water never penetrates into the internals of that rock. It never penetrates deep into that rock. But you can take a sponge. You can take a sponge and you can dump a sponge or dip a sponge in, like, like in water. And all of a sudden the sponge begins to to like change and the sponge begins to take on a new form and and all of a sudden that water penetrates down to to the depths and so that water becomes the essence of of uh, alters the essence of the sponge and listen you when you worship and you pursue his passions it changes the essence of of, of who you are and it is possible when you go through a difficult experience to lose the sense of God's presence. But do not confuse that because you don't feel that he is near, that he is not near. Job went through this. If you're life journaling with us, we're, we're like life journaling right now. Fact is what we read it this morning, what, what, or whenever you read it, uh, read it today in today's reading. For me, it's in the morning. But uh, I think it's Job 20, 28. 28, 29, verse 18. I know it's verse 18. It's either verse, uh, chapter 28 or, verse 20, or chapter 29. So I, I'm close. And all of a sudden, Job expressed why his world was rocked. Because Job says, God, I thought I was going to live a very long life with all of my kids around me. And here he'd lost his health, he'd lost his kids, he'd lost like everything. See, Job got into this, Job chapter 23, and he lost a sense of God's presence. Verse, verse, verse 8, behold, I go forward, but, but he is not there. And backward, and I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right, but I, I do not see him. In other words, Job felt God wasn't near. Yet in his inability to feel God, Job resolved, verse 10, this is out of faith. But he knows, the, he knows the way that I take. In other words, he is near. And when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Listen, let me tell you something. God is near you, whether you're happy or sad. And you learn to cling to his character. When, when, when we went in this, it, it started for us on August, August the 14th. We'll never forget that day. That was a diagnosis. So we'll never forget that, forget that date. And so it, it was Karen that all of a sudden, just immediately into the family, says, look for the rainbows. In every storm, there's a rainbow. And a rainbow is significant of a promise from God. And so she said, every day, you know what? We're not going to focus. We're going to look for the rainbow. And so you, you take the scriptures and you start, you start developing a promise list. You start developing a rainbow list. And so we, we started, and I started, and we started as a family that God, you know what? God is still sovereign, and God still knows our name, and the angels still respond to his call, and the death of Jesus still saves souls, and the Spirit of God dwells uh, in the saints, and, and God is faithful. God is not caught off guard by this, and God can use everything in our life for his glory and for my ultimate good, because that's, that's a promise. And he, uses, he can use tragedy to accomplish his will. And his will is right and it's holy and it's perfect. Um, sorrow may come at, the, at, at night, but joy comes in the morning. And, and God, God bears much fruit in our lives in affliction. And, and we, we have verses. We have verses on cards. Here's one. Here's two of our family verses. And, and one is, they do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. 
That's in our list. Another one, Psalm, Psalm 112, 4 says, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright, for he is gracious, merciful, and righteous. And you have to come to that place and just be reminded that he, he is good and he is faithful. Even though we don't understand it, the second thing of a lament is this. You have to come to the place you describe what happened. You come to the place in life to where you described what happened. You talk to, you address God directly and you describe what happened. Uh, verse 3 and 4. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see there is no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. In other words, you, you tell him and you process it out and you write it out and you come to this place to where you begin to trace the tracks of your tears and you, de you describe what happens and you learn to lean on people. I mean, the psalmist said he, he's isolated, feels like no one cares for his soul. If you look at the context of it, that's just not true. In other words, when you go through this, that's not a time to withdraw. It's not a time to be a hermit. Man, I, I'm, I'm just telling you. I do not know how people make it without God in a life group. I do not know how people make it without God and, and, and Christian friends. I mean, that's the, that's the power of the local church. The theology of the local church, I would just never get, is when we minister to one another. We come into community with one another. We know one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. I and mean, I'm telling you, if you're not in a life group, you're like missing out. Every week I hear stories of what God has done in someone's life when a life group was willing just to minister to them and pray for them and encourage them. And I don't know what it is about contemporary Christianity that we think, you know what, we can just be isolated. And there is power in people joining together in prayer. Matthew 18, 20 says, for, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. There I am. I mean, you can sense the presence of God in, 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 like, in like a life group. And when we started this journey, we had a friend of a friend that lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and, and, uh, and this individual is a Christian uh, neurosurgeon. And so he was gracious enough late one night to talk to Brittany on a cell phone, and, and the words that he spoke into her life uh, were, were life-changing for not only her but for us. And he, and he says, you know, Brittany, I'm a neurosurgeon, and, and I've reconciled Scripture with my scientific mind. And here's what I would tell you this is not going to cut your life short. Your days were ordained before the creation of the world. And as a neurosurgeon, we've given people short timelines and they've outlived it. So don't worry about the timeline. Because I'm telling you, your days were already ordained. And this is not going to cut your life short a single day. The third one is this, in a lament, it's a confession of trust. It's a belief that, you know what, God hears me, and God speaks to me. In other words, it's a belief that, you know what, God's help, I'll get through this. Man, maybe rock bottom in your life came in a diagnosis. Maybe it came in a foster home. Maybe it came in a, a traumatic story. Listen, Joseph, remember Joseph? Joseph was thrown in a hole. He was thrown in a pit uh, and forgotten by his brothers. And, and maybe you were thrown. Maybe you were thrown in a pit. Maybe you were thrown in an unemployment line and forgotten. And maybe, maybe you were thrown in a divorce and abandoned. And maybe you were thrown into a bed and abused. And, and, and maybe you hit rock bottom, a kind of death that, that some people never recover from. In verse 5, he goes on, he says, And I cry to you, O Lord, and say, You are my, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of living. In other words, you know what he's saying? God, if you don't comfort me. I won't be comforted. The pain is too great. The crisis is too great. You know what he's saying? He said, you know what, God, you can do whatever you want to do. All I can do is trust you and depend on you to comfort me. How do you flourish in the midst of tragedy? Fortunately, we don't have to speculate about that. Man, we can look at Joseph's life and his brothers had, had done him wrong and it was 20 years after they threw him in the pit. He gets to meet them again. And Joseph had worked through forgiveness, and he worked through it, and he, he writes these words in, in, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. 
He says, as for you, talking to his brother, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In other words, you know what jo Joseph was saying? Joseph was saying is this, in God's hand, intended evil becomes my eventual good. Joseph trusted in God, and Joseph tr tied himself. He, he looked for rainbows, and he tied himself in the, in, in, in the promises of God, but he didn't ignore the presence of evil. He says, you meant, I mean, you meant evil against me. I mean, J Joseph used, listen, it's so cool. Joseph used a Hebrew word that, meant to, that means to weave. It's a, it's a weaver's term. So fascinating that he chose that word. And so you know what Joseph is saying? Joseph is saying to his brothers, you tried to weave evil into my life. You tried to, to, to weave evil into my life, but God rewove it for good. God picked the thread. God picked the colors. And God is the master weaver. And he is the one that stretches out the thread. And he is the one that stretches out the different threads. And he is the one that stretches out the different colors. The, the pain with the pleasures. And nothing, listen, nothing escapes his reach. Every president. Circumstance. Weather pattern. Every event, every molecule is at his command. And, see, and Satan weaves. And God will reweave if you trust him. In other words, God is the master builder. In fact, it's, it's, it's a construction term also that Joseph said. I realized in Pueblo, with all this construction, there's two types of people. It's one group of people that hate construction and you gripe about it every time. There's another group of people that, that understand it and they're patient with it. You know the difference? The people that are patient with it and understand it, they understand the master plan. They understand one day it's going to be good for our city and it's going to be good for our traffic flow and it's just a, a small blip on the radar. Another group of people that are still griping and complaining and cussing about it, they don't understand the master plan. They think it's going to be this way forever. You know the reason a lot of us have problems with when we hit rock bottom? We don't understand the master plan. And that's why we never process through it. The fourth one is this. It's a prayer statement of what, of what you want God to do. It's a prayer statement of what you want God to do. Verse 6. Attend to my cry for I'm, I am brought very low. Deliver me from, from my persecutors for they are too strong for me. In other words, you come to the place to where, you know what? You just tell God what you want him to do in your life. You come to that place to where you begin to tell him, this is what I want you to do in my life. And listen, through this journey, and through that journey of coming out, it, it may change. In other words, I, I think in our culture, and I think in our time, we've, 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 we've come to the place to where we have very little regard for what God will do. We, we want him to do something right now. And, and, and that's why we sing some of the worship songs that we do here. This is what you did in the past. This is what you are doing. And this is what you will do. One of the, one of the lyrics of a, of a, of a worship song that, that we sing here is just ministering to our family so much right now. And it's just that lyric that's, that says, with the faith that you have given us, we will step in the valley unafraid because we trust you. Because you're good. The last thing is this. It's, it's a vow of praise. And when God moves, verse 7, he says, Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, and you will deal bountifully with me. I'm telling you, if you don't lament, if you don't process, You'll never heal. From a human level, it can appear that nothing good is going to come out of this. But I've learned this. We've learned two things in our family. 
we have, we have learned that seasons that we go through in life are not only to teach us perseverance and character, as James would say, but these seasons of life are also to teach us the goodness of God. And we would tell you, even in the midst of this, God has been very, very good to us. And we, we have our praise list. And we have the things that we thank him for. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who, those who love God, all things work together for good. And so God has promised to render beauty out of all things, not each thing. Isolated events in our life may be evil. But they can ultimately be for our good. I mean, we, we see examples of this in life, right? When we sip on a, a cup of coffee and we say this is good. I mean, what are we saying? The, the plastic bag that holds the beans is good? The beans themselves are good? The hot water is, is good? The coffee maker, the coffee filter is good? No, none of these. Good happens when all the ingredients work together. And the bag is open, the beans are ground into a powder, the water is heated to the right temperature. And it's a collective cooperation of these elements that creates good. Nothing in the Bible would call us to call a famine good or a heart attack good or a, a crisis good or a terrorist attack good. They're terrible calamities born out of a fallen earth. But we must define what is good. See, our, our definition of good is health and comfort and, and success and, and recognition. That's why a lot of people don't serve. And we've got to have a new definition of good. In the case of his son, Jesus Christ, the good life consisted of struggles and storms and death. But God worked it all together for the greater good. His glory and our, our salvation. It simply comes down to this. Trust God or turn away. That's the reason we observe communion. Of just a reminder that he is good. Our servers are going to make their way to the back as they get the elements and they begin passing out the elements in, in just a second. If you've never been here at Fellowship the Rockies when we've taken communion together as a, as a church family, in just a few minutes the ushers or servers are going to begin bringing the elements down. There's a plate with two cups one on top of the other, and you just, you just pull both cups. There's one on top of the other. Just You pull the, the, the two cups out of the plate, and then you pass the plate to the person next to you. And then you hold those elements there in place until in just a few minutes where we'll take of the bread and we'll take of the juice together as a, as a church family. And we practice open, uh, open communion here, which simply means this. If you're a believer in Christ, we ask you to partake and to take communion with us and the scripture talks about this the scripture talks that before we take of the bread and we take of the juice that we examine our lives not somebody else's life not our neighbor's life not our friend's life not our spouse's life and in the context in which that was written it was to examine our life to see how we are participating within the body the local church are we encouraging one another, praying for one another, supporting one another, coming into community with one another? And maybe tonight you would just, you just sit before him. That before we take of the bread and before we take of the juice, just to examine your life as well. As you follow him. So as the elements are being passed out, you just sit before him. We'll take of the bread and take of the juice in just a few moments as a church family. Before we take of the bread, the scripture says this. The scripture says, Apostle Paul's writing, and he says, For I, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. 
that the Lord Jesus on the night when, when he was betrayed, he took bread. And he had given, after he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this. Do this in, in remembrance of me. We remember the faithfulness of God. Nobody there at that crucifixion scene would have said that was good. So they didn't understand. They didn't understand the master plan. But out of that tragedy became the forgiveness for our sins that we could have eternal life and total and complete forgiveness. And so when we come to this place, we just remember the faithfulness of God. So, Father, we just thank you for your love and we just thank you for your grace. Father, we thank you for the power of your name and the, just your word. And so, Father, we thank you that regardless of what we go through, regardless of what we walk through, that we, we can trust you. And so, Father, this night, we just tell you thank you for your faithfulness. And we can be totally and completely forgiven. We can have a relationship with a holy and a righteous God. We have a gift of eternal life in heaven. And so, Father, we thank you for that. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take with me, please? Scripture also says in, in the same way after, after supper... Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and in other words this is part of our testimony of who we are as believers and who we are as Christians that we trust him and we follow him and by the shedding of his blood there's total and complete forgiveness of sin before we take of the juice, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your blood on the cross, for by it we can be totally and completely forgiven. And may we live with, with that freedom that we have in you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take with me, please? <clears throat>